talk about interfaces in C sharp. Um, well, the point of this video is to attempt to offer a simple explanation of interfaces, what they're used for, or how they can be used, and uh, offer a simple explanation of it. This was a hard subject for me to wrap my head around because no one wants to show you from top to bottom how to use them. Um, or they're just incapable of doing it because they only speak robot. Um, through the presentation, I'm going to talk about what interfaces are and how they can be used. I'll attempt to stay as high level as possible. Now, I'm obviously not going to go into the more advanced uses of interfaces, but rather um, provide a good starting point for the use of interfaces. And just to keep us on the same page, I am approaching this from the view of somebody that wants to begin using interfaces in their code versus somebody who is simply consuming classes which have implemented interfaces. And I'm also assuming that you have a basic understanding of the object-oriented principles, or API, and that is abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. Um, so if you have a good understanding of those basics, then you shouldn't get too lost in here. So have we, have we at least heard of interfaces at this stage? Um, I'm sure you've at least heard of a few of them. Uh, for instance, iDisposable allows you to use uh, inline using statements that properly dispose of themselves. Uh, IEnumerable allows you to move through a collection with, say, a for each loop. Uh, iQueryable allows you to query collections using uh, different technologies such as Link. Now, as you're learning about the different classes in the .NET library, you'll probably find yourself on MSDN at least once or twice an hour uh, looking up the details of the class. Uh, the first thing that you'll see in the syntax section is the class header. And in this class header, you'll see any interfaces that this class uh, may have implemented. But, but what does this mean? What, what are those interfaces? Well, in short, interfaces describe functionality. By implementing an interface, you're essentially telling anything that handles your object that you possess a certain behavior or, or set of behaviors or functionality. But why would you need to do this? Well, we're going to get to that. Um, but let's start, let's look at the very bottom here. Here we declare a class called child. Now, by implementing an interface called iJuggle, we are uh, declaring that this class or this child knows how to juggle. Now let's jump out of the human category and declare a class called monkey. Now by implementing the same interface I juggle, we are declaring that this class or monkey knows how to juggle. So that's a basic overview of that. Now there are a lot of arguments against interfaces from those that either don't fully understand them or just aren't comfortable with them. Uh, if you want to implement certain functionalities, why not just inherit from some sort of base class? Well, just to review, uh, and I apologize for not having slides for this, but abstract classes are classes that cannot be instantiated, but can possess default implementations of certain behaviors. Abstract behaviors or methods have n uh, no default implementation and have to be overridden by the derived class or its child class. Virtual methods have a default implementation but can be overridden optionally. Normal methods in an abstract class will be inherited by the derived classes and cannot be overridden. Now, interfaces are purely abstract. They have no implementations of anything, although they can contain hints when you get into uh, slightly more advanced interfaces. Uh, all methods must be implemented in some way using the same method name and the exact same parameter list as defined in that interface. The major factor, I think, with interfaces versus abstract classes is that interfaces describe functionality rather than traits. In other words, it concentrates more on what something can do rather than what something is. For instance, a pilot is a person, but that doesn't tell me anything special about what he can do. But if the person class implements the I eat food interface, it tells me that anything that is a person can eat food. Thus, the pilot can eat food since it derives from person, and the person class has implemented the I eat food interface. And uh, as we said earlier, by implementing an interface, you are telling the world that you can perform all of the functions, all the functions associated with that interface. Now that was a lot to chew on, but we're going we're to break that apart here 
uh, in just a moment. Uh, the other thing is interfaces can be attached to anything and that would force that class to implement uh, the uh, functions uh, sorry of excuse me I'm clicking around here uh, it forces those classes to implement those functions we can uh, use this to keep our code flexible but cohesive but what do I mean by cohesive in short cohesive just means that everything inside of your class should be directly dependent on the class itself in other words, if it doesn't, if it's not specific to that class, then it shouldn't be in that class as much as possible, anyway. So let's walk through a scenario here. Let's say we create a class of person. Inside of this class, we would define things like height and weight and name and hair color and so on, and we could define some behaviors. Now let's assume one of those behaviors was eat food, which contains instructions on how this person consumes food. Now, and I, I didn't add this into the slide, and I apologize again, but let's say we, uh, again, jump outside the human realm and create another class called monkey. Now, this monkey would also possess a height, a weight, maybe a name, hair color, and so on. And more importantly, it would also have a behavior for consuming food. So why not just inherit from the person class so that we can take on some of the similar traits instead of duplicating our code? <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Uh, let's go back to our person class and imagine that it also had a uh, an attribute called uh, owns car. Let's say it's a Boolean attribute. It's true or false, and uh, whether or not this person owns car owns a car. Well, guess what? Now that your monkey has inherited from person, it also inherited that attribute as well. It now owns a car. Now, what this actually did was demonstrate a violation of encapsulation and poor cohesion. The monkey now has access to owning a car and any number of other traits that are completely irrelevant to being a monkey. Okay, so we've identified some potential problems here, which is a good start, but what do interfaces have to do with this? Where do interfaces come into play? Well, the cool thing about interfaces is that they can be attached to anything because when we attach them to a class, we're essentially binding that class to a contract. And that contract says that this class now has to possess the behaviors described in that interface. And, and on a side note, in C Sharp, we can only inherit from one base class, but we can implement uh, several interfaces. And by implementing those interfaces, we are being more descriptive about uh, some of the special functionality of that class. Now, since interfaces uh, describe functionality, we can now begin to uh, write other code that is reliant on the interface itself rather than on the specific class, and we'll get to that here in a second. By doing this, you'll be reducing the explicit dependency, which is what we call loose coupling. Now, loose coupling can be a tough concept, but is definitely your key to write, uh, writing maintainable and flexible code. So moving on, one of the hardest things uh, to teach is creativity, but by keeping loose coupling in mind, you can open yourself up to plenty of opportunities to make your code more flexible and more reusable. Really, the tough part is identifying those opportunities to do so. Hopefully, the example that I'm about to walk through will demonstrate this. Now, let's take a class called Vehicle, for example. Let's say that this class has some behaviors like move forward, turn left, turn right, and stop. Okay, now let's create a class called car, which inherits from vehicle. Now obviously, the car's movements are going to be, uh, the instructions to move are going to be more specific than a generic vehicle. So what we would do in this class in practice was would be to override that code to be more specific on how that car would perform those actions, moving forward, turning left, etc. Now let's create a class called airplane, which also inherits from vehicle. And again, obviously, the plane's movements will have a completely different set of instructions on how this thing is going to move around. The same will go for, say, a boat. It has a completely different implementation of the same action. Okay, great. So we've covered basic abstraction and polymorphism here. Now let's create a couple of other classes uh, and you know trot down this road a little bit further. Let's create a person class. Now a person would also have the same behaviors for moving forward, left, right, and stopping but obviously it's going to work a little bit different. So let's keep going. Let's create a wheelchair person. Now this inherits from, uh, from the person class, but it would obviously move a little bit differently. And let's say we'll make one called person with a cane. 
and this inherits from person, but again, would obviously move around a little bit differently. Okay, so we've continued on with our demonstration of the distraction and polymorphism. So now what? Let's say these objects were actually things in a video game. Okay, so what might they have in common? The different types of people are obviously related, because they're all abstracted from people, and the vehicles are related, because they all come from vehicle. Um, but people aren't related to vehicles. Rather, they're not abstracted from vehicles. So what do they have in common? Well, maybe it's the person playing the video game, the person controlling these things. Player one. So let's say, player one, I need you to control the different vehicles or move these people around. Well, shit, now, now I'm dealing with another object here, and we're going to we're gonna have to tie these things together. So let's create another object called player. Now inside player, we're going to create methods that control the different types of things here. Now right out of the gate, this is what we would normally come up with if we didn't know any better, is we would have a method called move that accepts an airplane. We'd have a method called move that accepts a car. We would have a method called move that accepts a wheelchaired person. And we would have a method called move that accepts a person with a cane. Now, that's a bit much. Now, we would have to create a different method for every class that we hope to send into this, this player object to be controlled. That's just, that could get real dirty real fast. Now, using polymorphism, we can condense this down by having it, these move methods accept the parent classes instead of the specific child classes. Now, this exploits our is a relationship of derived classes to their parents. For example, an airplane is a vehicle. So any method that takes in a vehicle would also take an airplane because they're synonymous for all intents and purposes. So by doing this, we can take our six different classes, vehicle, car, airplane, person, wheelchair person, and person with a cane, and bring them from six down to their two parent or base classes, vehicle and person. So now we can update our static behaviors in our player class and eliminate all the derived classes uh, and their implementations of different movements down to two methods, which would be your uh, one that accepts vehicle and one that accepts person. Now if we feed the move uh, behavior that accepts a vehicle and tell it you know, to move left, as we're showing here in the code, uh, polymorphism would take over. Uh, if you sent it an airplane, it would know that it's an airplane vehicle and it would execute the correct behavior to move left, right, wherever. And if you sent it a car, it would know it's a car. Um, uh, again, polymorphism. Now this is a lot better because now anything that derives from vehicle can be accepted into the first method and anything that derives from person can be accepted into the second method. This is much more flexible. But what if we were to create some other classes like lions or tigers or bears? Well, we could do methods for each one of them, or we can go back and do a single method that accepts uh, objects derived from uh, animal. But really, inside each method could be a lot of code to handle the movement, like maybe reporting of starting and stopping coordinates and so on. Can you imagine how out of control this could get when you have complex code and countless behaviors to handle it all? Here we have just identified the opportunity for an interface. We have just ident ident excuse me. We have just identified a pattern or common ally here, the functionality of basic movement. So now all of these things are sharing, at the very least, the ability to move forward, left, right, and stop. So let's create an interface called iMove, and this will force the implementation of these behaviors. Now, be by creating this, we are telling any class that implements uh, that implements it that they must provide instructions for these behaviors. And by having a class implement this interface, we are also telling the world that this class has implemented these behaviors. We have just created a contract or a declaration and a promise of a certain behavior. Now by doing this, we have also opened another door because now we can use the interface like a type. And this is where this gets kind of cool. So let's go back and update our static player class to utilize this interface. So what do we do here? Now we have a single method that will accept any object that has implemented the iMove contract. 
Now this method doesn't care if you give it a boat or a firefighter or an elephant or a radio controlled car or a gingerbread man. So long as it has implemented the interface, this fucker will work. We have just reduced the dependencies of this method. It, that I think that's very cool. So how does this ha help uh, code maintain maintainability? Well, imagine you have a class called old guy. This has three fields and one method that returns the value of the given name field. You also have a helper class that for whatever reason you have to use to make this thing work. This helper class receives an old guy object and runs its function that returns the given name. Now the FNG in the cube next to you creates a new class that everybody is supposed to use called new guy. But instead of three fields, this thing has one field and the same behavior returns the same value using uh, maybe a more clever approach. Maybe the method name is even different. Now your helper, your helper class is broken. You can't simply replace the old guy with the new guy without something going drastically wrong. Now you're going to have to go back into your code and recode your helper class to work with the new object. Keep in mind, this is a very simple and small scale example. You can only imagine what the production code would look like and the chain of events that you'll have to go through uh, trying to track down every instance of, uh, of the break where you switch the object from the, from the old one to the new one. So here's what you can do. Create an interface that possesses the functionality that must be enforced. Ensure that your classes implement those interfaces. Then ensure your helper method takes the interface instead of a specific type. And Bob's your uncle. Now either one of these are, are, are actually going, uh, going to work. You can send it to the, the new guy or you can send it to the old guy. It really doesn't matter. It'll take either one because they both in implement the uh, interface. So they have the same method name and they return the same value. Um, and what's more, if you decide to later on come back and replace the old guy and the new guy with a robot, which does not abstract from person, it'll still work as long as it implements the I say name interface. That is very cool. Now, just to stop for a second here, um, one of the things I did here, if you notice on the on the left side where I show the interface and the objects, I show that I inherited from person and also implemented an interface. And I did this for both classes, person and interface. And the reason that I did that is to show that the parent class or type of class doesn't matter. Over here in our robot, our Cylon Centurion, it inherits from Toaster, but it also implements the iSayName interface. So this interface, as related to this method uh, parameters, are all that matters, as long as these two match up. Right? Do some drawing over here. As long as these match up, it takes it all. And I showed that in an earlier slide. Okay, so that pretty much covers what interfaces are used for and how you can use them. And you can blow this up about a thousand different levels and, and, and bring this to your benefit. And this is what gives you that flexible code where you can swap things out without breaking your entire application. So I'm sure you want to see this in action. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut down this, this uh, slideshow and I'm going to come back and with Visual Studio and we're going to do some of this stuff for real and see how it works.